Welcome to Climate Plus, a DevX podcast. I'm Michael Igo, senior reporter at DevX. Every year, usually around this time, the world turns its attention to climate change and what we're doing or not doing about it. At the UN Climate Conference, or COP, negotiators get deep into the weeds on every aspect of the climate crisis. This year, it's happening in Dubai. To help make sense of this complex, critical moment, we're bringing you conversations with leading climate thinkers, activists, and experts, and asking them, can COP28 deliver? The best guarantee that we have of sustained climate action is a informed, committed, passionate citizenry on a scale that we've never mobilized before. It's important to be realistic about what a climate cop can achieve. Unless you're following this process really, really closely, and to be fair, I know a lot of you are, you might find it hard to come up with a list of really big breakthroughs from the negotiations or to remember the major outcomes of COP8 or 18 or even 27. Don't get me wrong, there are breakthroughs. But for the most part, this is an incremental process. And let's not forget, nearly three decades into this process, we are still woefully short of addressing the climate crisis. It begs the question, is climate activism working? If not, Why not? And how does climate activism relate to the nitty gritty of scoring important but ultimately incremental wins on the climate policy front? Kumi Naidu thinks about these questions a lot, or maybe more accurately, worries about them. And as a former leader of Greenpeace and Amnesty International, he's worrying from some serious experience. He also has some big ideas about how climate activism needs to change, in some cases, maybe even to learn from its adversaries. Here's our conversation. Kumi, thanks so much for being here. Happy to be with you. So we're talking about COP28. We're talking about climate change policy and action. Um, You come at this from the perspective of an activist, a longtime activist leader. I just, to start... I would love to hear how you think about and understand the relationship between activism and climate change today. I know that's a big general question, but let's start there. Well, Albert Einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. I must confess that I I meet that definition of insanity. Uh, in the sense that if we look at the climate negotiations, we have gone to them year on, you know, every year trying to push. And and it's not to say that we don't get breakthroughs or we don't get movement in the right direction, but we also have to recognize that putting all our eggs in the cop basket, so to speak, is not actually um, yielding the results that the science and Uh, extreme weather events are telling us we need to achieve. So when I reflect on why is our activism not having the impact that it needs to have, I land on a couple of conclusions. The one is that I think the climate justice movement has tried to win the narrative by facts, figures, science, rationality, policy proposals, and so on. And I think a lot of that is so focused on the head, as so little of it is focused on the heart, the body, the mind, and the soul. And sadly, if you look at the sort of emerging quasi-fascist movements from the United States to France and everywhere else that we are seeing, they have long abandoned the idea of you win and move people with facts what you see is that they weaponize feelings and emotions and so on 
So partly, I think that we are in a situation where we must be brutally honest with ourselves that if we are to turn things around, activism, given the threat and scale and the urgency of the climate crisis, needs to actually be able to mobilize on uh, people on a scale that we've never been able to do before. So basically, given, you know, as Naomi Klein in her book says, to change everything, we need everybody, you know, and it's it's really important that we recognize that we are really not anywhere where we need to be in terms of the kind of impact and effectiveness that we need. I, I, let me just give you a, an example to, 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 to give it some flavor, right? I found myself on an inflatable boat going to occupy an oil rig in the Greenlandic Arctic in 2011. And I I don't swim. <laughs> and I don't think my c- colleagues knew that I don't swim <laughs> very well. And I was looking very nervous and... My colleague said, oh, don't worry, you know, you fall in the ocean, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to fish you up before you die from hypothermia. And I had this horrible thing, uh, sense that, wow, if this was the last time I was standing up for justice, 99% of my friends, family and comrades back home in Africa wouldn't know what the banner I was carrying said. It said, stop Arctic destruction. This was in 2011 when very few people understood that the Arctic is a refrigerator and air conditioner for the planet. And so anyway, to cut a long story short, I end up in prison. I get home a couple of weeks later to South Africa, and one of the kids in the family says to me, Uncle Kumi, what a stupid slogan, stop Arctic destruction. Nobody understood what you were talking about. Then I said, what would have been a better slogan? And she said, well, for starters... Save Santa Claus now. She was saying, you folks in the movements that try to move things forward, you'll intellectualize things too much. You'll don't understand where people's consciousness is. And she was saying, listen, if the majority of people in the world only understanding of what's happening in the Arctic or only connection that they have with the Arctic is that Santa Claus is chilling out there, uh, (laughs) then connect with that reality. In fact, she went so far as saying you should have, you know, uh, done the action dressed as Santa Claus. Now, that might sound as trivializing the issue. That's how the sort of, you know, the policy wonks in our movements will, 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 will respond to it. But the problem is activism is not resonating with ordinary people in sufficient numbers. And that's one of the biggest changes that we need to make. And I'll just conclude by saying that where I'm putting my energies right now is in what we call energizing artivism, which is bringing the worlds of arts, culture, and activism together. I want to dig into something that you mentioned there, which is this sort of tension between the, you know, head-focused science and the heart-focused um, implications or, or, or passion or the way that this resonates with people. How do you strike that balance? Because it does seem to me that the climate movement is a movement that has emerged directly from the science. And I wouldn't imagine that you would want to push things in the direction, um, the sort of opposite direction that you're describing, which is, you know, appealing purely to people's emotions and sort of leaving the science by the wayside. So how do you, how do you keep this a factual movement um, while also making sure that you're you're presenting it in the ways that resonate most clearly and most effectively with people. Well, let's be very clear. We need to stick to facts, but there's nothing in any rule book that says facts need to be boring. Right? Good communicators, good activists are ones who can stay true to what the science or what other contextual realities and research are telling us, but we need to be able to recognize if we talk in terms of 1.5 degrees, for example, I just addressed the meeting of Engineers Without Borders this weekend, right? Smart young people and 400 in the room. And I say, when I say 1.5 degrees, raise your hands if you feel confident that you know what that's about. And only a quarter of the folks raise their hands, right? And if that is such a key part of the science, 
why have we not been able to, you know, move that forward? So like in the Pacific, for example, in 2015 already, from the ground up, I had learned a slogan when I was the head of Greenpeace at that time, where people were chanting a slogan, 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 to stay alive. And by the way, six weeks later, when I met them in Paris, the slogan changed to 1.5, we might survive, right? Now, I'm not saying that that solves the problem for you, but even that, in framing it in that way, it makes it more human, it makes it more real. And that's not how most climate activists are speaking, right? And that's also because, let's be blunt about it, the climate movement has been far too white and far too middle class for far too long, right? The failure to incorporate and engage uh, people in a diversity of settings to draw on their cultural wisdoms, to draw on their experience, to draw on the way they communicate and their narratives is a failing of the climate activist movement and that needs to be urgently addressed. Climate Plus is supported by the World Bank. Back in October, World Bank President Ajay Banga called for a new vision for ending poverty on a livable planet with a focus on climate action. We cannot endure another period of emission-heavy growth. We must find a way to finance a different world where our climate is protected, where pandemics are manageable, if not preventable, where food is abundant and fragility and poverty are defeated. We do not suffer from a shortage of solutions. We're just paralyzed by a persistent lack of courage to pursue them. The good news is that we have solutions like these within reach and resources at our disposal to scale them. To learn more about efforts to end poverty on a livable planet, search for the World Bank Group at COP28 or click the link in the show notes. It seems to me that part of the problem here is the way that the activist passions and the the movement translates into policy. And maybe this is not, I'm sure it's not specific to climate change, but when I think of COP, you know, it's very focused on um, these incredibly technical aspects of international climate change policy It's very jargony, very important, but very jargony pieces of this this climate policy puzzle. What do you do about that? Because those are the those are the opportunities to change the direction of policy is in the negotiating chambers where, you know, negotiators are arguing over individual words, shell versus will and could versus, you know, will consider and all of this stuff. And, And it seems like that gets a lot of attention. So how do you how do you still push on those technical pieces while keeping the bigger picture in mind? So sadly, I've uh, spent far too many hours of my life in those shell will, you know, kind of conversations, you know, in the negotiations. So so I think that listen, if COP didn't exist, we'd have to create it, right? But let's be very blunt about it. That COP is a very very flawed, problematic negotiating reality. Let me just be, give you the statistic. If we take, for example, the COP in Glasgow, the largest delegation to the COP was not the UK government that was hosting it, a rich so-called developed country government, but the largest delegation was the fossil fuel industry with about 510 delegates, right? Uh, you know, that's as absurd as... Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous holding a global conference and the largest delegation to the conference is the alcohol industry. So so I I want to be very clear that, yes, we have to move things forward in the negotiations and get the best out of it. But we should be very clear that COP in itself is not going to give us the climate solutions that we need. Because if you look, because this is, as you correctly say, not a problem only affecting the climate movement, right? It's affecting all areas of activism, right? So so if you look at what is COP, it's a global kind of consensus building 
uh, forum. And the reality is that global governance as a, you know, if you want to call it as a system, suffers from four deficits. A democratic deficit because it's completely dominated by the global north. More accurately, you could say, by the global minority. Um, secondly, uh, it suffers from a coherence deficit, right? Because what gets uh, decided in one forum gets contradicted in another. Like, for example, all the commitments made uh, historically by Europe, which sees itself as, you know, on the front end of uh, climate action, everything was thrown out of the window the moment uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, right? In terms of, you saw uh, black backsliding on how fossil fuel expansion was happening and so on. And then you've got a uh, compliance deficit, and that's the biggest problem, right? Just because you get an agreement at COP, and bear in mind, these are not legally binding uh, agreements, and that is the biggest problem. People must not be given false hope and false expectation, as sometimes we do, by saying to the world, oh, you know, COP is coming, we, everything is at stake, and so on. Listen, if we can get the best language agreed at COP, the reality is the United States and other powerful governments of the world can easily walk away from it as they do all the time. So one has to recognize that the best guarantee that we have of sustained climate action is a informed, committed, passionate citizenry on a scale that we've never mobilized before, that irrespective of what is agreed at a COP or not, we will see action in the right direction. Because the reality is, you know, the practical implementations of the solution of how to address climate uh, action is going to be made by individual governments in, in various national spaces, right? So, so at the best, the way I see COP is it's about getting the best out of a really bad system so that we should be saying that is not actually what we need. It's much less than what we need. Like, like say on loss and damage, right? The fact that uh, we got movement in Egypt on loss and uh, damage, uh, many people said, ah, you'll never get it. The rich nations will block you and so on. Okay. The fact that we got language and loss and damage uh, is significant, but it's not that money is flowing to loss and damage uh, investments and so on. But what it means, it creates a basis for activism to try to push what is sometimes vague words on a negotiated document and give it substance. So that's how I would balance the tension between, you know, the reality is we need a negotiating process. We must recognize it's terribly flawed and it's very controlled by the global north. Historically, even though that's been balancing out a little bit more recently, but certainly the dominance of the process historically has been one where global North governments are the ones that actually call the shots. And I don't think in substance that has changed much. Are you looking for the inside story on what's happening at organisations like the World Bank, USAID or the Gates Foundation? Then you need to be reading DevEx Pro. I'm Jessica Abrahams and I'm the editor of DevEx Pro. Pro is DevEx's premium news subscription, where our expert reporters and analysts take you beyond the headlines, deep into the trends and institutions shaping the $200 billion aid industry. As well as all our news, you'll get access to conversations with global development leaders, resources to help you grow in your career, and a subscriber-only newsletter full of insider news and tidbits. See for yourself by getting a free trial today at devx.com slash pro. Part of what you're saying is that it's an activist victory to be able to make even small gains in those spaces that are dominated by non activists by by powerful countries and powerful 
industries. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and to a large extent, what happens outside of the formal negotiations and the communicative value of that, in my mind, is more important than actually words on a piece of paper that we get out of the negotiations, right? Uh, because governments, you know, don't need to comply and they don't comply, right? I mean, so, so but what COP offers activism is a unique two-week period to call on the world to take notice, to understand that our political leaders are so beholden to the fossil fuel industry that they are not able to act with the urgency that the situation calls and that they need to be organizing, mobilizing, being creative, building solutions from bottom up and not waiting for governments and the corporate sector who continues to put profit before people and planet, the reality is the window of opportunity for us to prevent catastrophic runaway irreversible climate change is very small and closing very fast. The reality is that we are seeing on a weekly basis now around the world extreme weather events which are taking lives, damaging infrastructure, destroying livelihoods and so on, and being able to you know, draw attention to those things using the COP as a communicate, communicative opportunity is um, what activism needs to do. I know that you're someone who thinks a lot about sort of intersectionality and interconnectedness, but I wonder how you think about kind of both the risks and the opportunities of tying these different crises together, sort of weaving them into one. I mean, we're still see we're seeing a you know, a debt crisis, uh, an inflation crisis, particularly hitting lower income countries, still the lingering effects of the pandemic. Obviously, these things are all interconnected. But but how do you think about when it does and doesn't make sense to sort of present them or to, to advocate about them as sort of one um, interconnected global crisis versus focusing on one and trying to get what you can do done in one particular area? Well, firstly, let me just say very, very strongly that the moment that we find ourselves in is one where we need to turbocharge intersectionality and that one of the disservice that the historic Western environmental movements engaged in was developing a false sense that we can operate in silos and that there's something called human rights, there's something called development, there's something called uh, climate and environment. That was a catastrophic error. So in the global south, if you cannot make an argument that addressing the climate realities that we face in such a manner that is also ensuring that the transition from an economy driven by dirty energy to an economy driven by clean energy is going to create jobs, right? And is going to actually improve livelihoods. If you can't do that, then you're not going to get traction because people are living on the point of desperation. And sadly, today, it's not only people in global south, but even in the global north, if we look at the position of working class people and low income folks, they are suffering as a result of an unjust economic system. And let's be very clear. We have a climate crisis because we have a broken economic system, right? And you don't fix the climate crisis unless you address the question of the fact that, you know, about trillion dollars a year is going in fossil fuel subsidies to oil, coal, and gas companies. So let me say that I don't see any way around really embracing the power of intersectionality to move things forward. I think that in the name of specialization, what we've got is parochialism. And, 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 and we must remind ourselves, you know, this is not about saving the planet. You know, if we continue on the trajectory that we're on, we warm our planet uh, to the point where we can't grow food, our water resources continue to be depleted, our soil continues to depleted. The end result is we will be gone as a species. The planet will still be here. And I always say to everyone who's concerned about saving the planet, 
don't worry about the planet because once we become extinct as a species, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish and so on. So when we are talking about the very survival of humanity as we know it, we must ask the question, why then is it that after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and after COVID, both of those things expose the brokenness of our economic system, our politics, and the inequality, and so on. Let's be very, very clear. We do not solve the climate crisis if we do not build an economic system where we share the finite resources on this planet in a significantly more equitable way than we currently have in practice. Kumi, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Climate Plus. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. And you can also leave us a rating or a review. We'll be publishing episodes twice a week in the lead up to, during, and after COP28. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. If you want to share some feedback on this episode or have questions you'd like answered, we'd love to hear from you. Drop me a message on X, formerly Twitter, at Alter Igo, or send an email to podcast at devx.com. Climate Plus is a podcast from DevX. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lauren Evans. The series editor is Catherine Cheney. It's hosted by me, Michael Igoe.